So, hello, my name is Antoine Couré. Uh, I am working for Essential Company in Mind Division. It is a Belgian company specialized in Linux embedded system. And I am also in my free time a Fedora contributor. So, uh, today uh, I will present a software update. How to update your embedded device because in your field it's a very important topic nowadays. And I guess we have some solutions to provide this kind of feature on your projects. So what is the plan of this conference? So first I will introduce a bit the topic, what we have to update and why updating an embedded system is more difficult than updating a PC. And then I will present some uh, update designs, at least three of them. After I will explain uh, what is software update tool uh, in generic presentation about uh, the list of features, what we can do with it. And I will finish by an implementation, just describe my use case uh, in production to see what we can do with it uh, in production or is it to do to implement some features around that. So, introduction. Why we have to update our embedded device? Uh, of course, first to fix bugs and security issues on the product because uh, a lot of devices are used during a long time, like 10, 20, or even 30 years. It's a long time. And during this time frame, in fact, a lot of security issues rise from the community or external people, like the kernel, glibc, basic tools. And uh, it's not acceptable for the customer to use a product with this kind of issue uh, for several years. And updating a device is also a nice way to provide new features when the development allows us to do that. But updating an, update, an embedded device, uh, it's some constraints, in fact, to keep in mind before implementing uh, that and having a lot of issues to fix them. So first, the cost because we have to develop this feature, and uh, the bandwidth could be a requirement for some project, because some of them, in Internet of Things context, are using a mobile connection to reach Internet, and could be expensive in some countries to provide a lot of data to make the update. Then there is a reliability, because an embedded device, we don't have uh, always a keyboard, a mouse, or a display, the user is not always aware that the software is running and is updatable and how to fix some issues. So this process should be really reliable to work every time and to be easy to fix in autonomous way or with a little bit effort for the user, but not too much. There are also some hardware capabilities that could be an issue for some projects because the CPU power is not enough, the memory is too low, like the storage. So some features around that could be uh, not really usable uh, in the real life because of that. So updating an embedded device, it could be a local or remote operation, depends on the uh, internet uh, accessibility. Uh, so if a uh, device like my personal TV uh, doesn't have access to internet, it could be nice to have a way to provide updates uh, over USB stick or SD card, for example. For the security, it's also very important. We have to be sure that the new firmware or the new stuff are coming from official developers and not from a man in the middle. So that is really important to keep in mind for the design of this solution. And the downtime is the last issue because in general, embedded devices are using for some purpose. And when we are updating the device, an amount of time, during an amount of time, the device is not usable at all, at least to reboot the device or to restart the service. And in some context, having this downtime is a critical issue. 
So now I will present some update design. So the first one is pretty straightforward. I guess you know it uh, because it's used by Linux distribution in general. So it's using packages in a repository. So you have a server with a list of packages for all components of your system. And on a regular basis, the devices are looking for new contents on this repository. If something is pushed, you can download and install it uh, automatically. So we have some, and we can use, of course, this design for embedded device. So some of them are using it. There are some advantages in doing that because we are downloading only packages and not the complete system every time. So it requires less bandwidth or uh, less storage than other solution. It's pretty simple to deploy, especially if you are using Yocto to build your system because Yocto is generating all packages every time that you build your final system. And the downtime is pretty short because it's only the reboot time or the time to restart the service. You don't need more time for that. But we have some disadvantages with this design, um, especially about the reliability. Because it's not really an atomic operation, except if you are using OS3, but it's not really used in production now uh, in embedded context. And if you have an issue with that, with the update, it's pretty difficult to roll back the update or to fix it automatically. So for example, you have a stunning uh, new uh, update for the kernel, for example, for example. But at this moment, you have a power failure. So what is, happen and what is happening? We don't know. Maybe the kernel is completely installed, maybe not and maybe it's not usable at all, or maybe just partially, and you have some issues with some other packages. We don't know, and uh, debugging that uh, without uh, having access to the device could be really, really difficult. And because partial updates are uh, possible in this uh, context, with this design, uh, the state of the device is not known perfectly. So you don't know exactly which, is, which are the versions of all components on your system, and you don't know exactly the compatibility between them, and eventually how to fix that, because updates are partial for whatever reason, for example, a bug uh, during the process. So personally, I don't recommend to use that because we have better solution. I will explain to others. So uh, the next one is a recovery race. The idea is pretty straightforward. We have a bootloader, of course, which could choose to boot the recovery OS or the regular OS. The recovery OS is pretty um, light. It's only the kernel with the basic tools and a software update, in your case, to make the update. So the purpose is just to check download, install the system on the regular partition. That's it, nothing more. So it's taking no much uh, storage, almost uh, 10 megabytes. And when the update is done, of course, we are using, in general, the regular operating system to use the device uh, correctly. Um, what is the advantages of this uh, design? It's pretty easy in case of issue for, uh, during the process or with the new firmware to go back to the recovery OS and restart the process. So in case of issue, we are normally always able to fix it automatically. And it doesn't require a lot of storage because only the extra partition for that and it's not too much. But we have some disadvantages of course, uh, with this design, uh, the recovery OS, we cannot update it. Why? Because if you are trying to update it and an issue happens at this moment, the recovery OS is not usable at all, and that is a big issue. 
Uh, the required bandwidth could be very high because we are downloading every time the complete firmware. So could be several uh, megabytes every time. And the downtime could be very long. Why? Because when we are using the recovery OS, we are not using the regular operating system with your application. So when you are downloading and installing the update, the device is not usable. So that could be an issue because it could take several minutes, especially if you have an issue during the process where we have to retry several times uh, the process. So we have to keep in mind uh, this issue in, for some situations. So the last design is a dual copy. It's very similar to the RecoverOS, but instead of using RecoverOS to download and install the new firmware, we are using another regular operating system for that. So in fact, you have the running copy of your firmware that is running every time. And when you are making an update from, him, uh, from it, you are installing in the standby copy. And during the next reboot, we restart to the standby copy, which becomes the running copy. So the idea, uh, the advantage is of this design is to update almost everything. So we can improve the update process or to fix some security issues in this, pro, in this uh, uh, the recovery OS, so can have, for example, some issues, uh, and we can't fix it with that design. The, it is an atomic operation. If an issue happens at any step of the process, we can still use the current firmware that is running fine, and we try eventually uh, the process. And the dump time is short because when we are downloading and installing the new firmware, we are running the application normally. So only the time to reboot the device is required and is a uh, dump time. But the disadvantages, of course, because we cannot have everything at once, uh, we need more bandwidth and storage for that because we are downloading a complete firmware every time and we need two partitions to have the complete firmware every time too. And it is not enough to have an update process that is working. We have to be sure that the new firmware is working well because otherwise, okay, we install a new firmware, we boot on it, but it's not working, and we try every time to boot on it, that is uh, not acceptable too. So we need a process to validate that the new firmware, it's okay to be used every time, and they need a lot um, more work for that. So for our designs, I'll provide some uh, tips uh, we should have at least, uh, if we are using a bootloader like you boot with an environment, this environment should be redundant. In case of issue during the writing step on this environment, we have always a working copy which is working and we are able to use the device uh, without issues. Of course, for security reason, uh, we have to sync our own crypt or firmwares every time. Uh, the encryption it depends on your requirements, but the signature is mm, at least mandatory, I guess. Um, also, in the bootloader step, to have an infinite loop proof uh, function uh, based on the watchdog or whatever uh, uh, function. Um, the idea is, if you are booting a firmware that is not running fine, so the watchdog is triggered every time, your application is always crashing uh, in short time, uh, you have too much restarts in quick uh, time, um, we have to fix it in an autonomous way, and the bootloader should detect this kind of failures and try to boot the recovery OS or the previous firmware in case of dual copy. 
Uh, just an example, uh, for example, in France, uh, an internet provider named Free provides a router named Freebox. And if you unplug and plug the power supply five times in consecutive way, uh, the router is booting the recovery OS directly to install a new firmware, whatever, why this situation happened, but it tries to do it to fix the issue and it's working uh, fine uh, in general. So that is an example of what we can do with that, with the previous design in the production. The user is able to try something which could kick, uh, fix in a quick way uh, is issue. And what we don't have to do is to try to update the bootloader itself, um, except if you have the uh, redundant bootloader, but it seems not really common uh, for the moment. So I don't recommend to do that, otherwise you can have a broken device and that is a big issue for the user. So now I will explain what is software update and how to use it. So, software update is an open source software developed by Stefano Babic from Dex company, uh, the company uh, which uh, write uh, Duboot too. Uh, so, I will present a lot of features and explain what could be interesting. Uh, so, first one is we can configure it at complete time, so like the kernel, busybox, etc. We can reduce the size of the binary and select only features that we want. Um, for embedded context, uh, it can handle a lot of embedded kind of storage, like SD card, EMMC, NAND flash, NOR flash, or UB volumes. So you don't have to take care about them. It's normally uh, completely supported and you have just to respect the API or the configuration, and that's okay. To get uh, updates, we have several ways. Uh, the first uh, one is um, it provides an, a web server, Mongoose, if I remember. Uh, so you can send the file to this web server and the device uh, receive it and can use it. You can reach a remote web server to download the content and to install the update. You can use a Noibig connector or having a local file. So if you have a new dev rules to start software update to look for a specific file in the AZ card when you insert it, it's possible. So it supports, of course, some basic features like compression, encryption, or signature shaking. So that is basic, but mandatory for this kind of uh, context. Um, I presented some uh, designs. So dual copy and recovery OS are uh, supported in nice way, so it doesn't need a lot of work for that. Uh, and the integration in the boots is working well, so that's normal. It's the same company that developed both. Uh, so it's easy to change in the process the variable of the U-boot environment at the end of the process to say, okay, the update uh, was done, or you can start another, the other partition. Um, you can check the software and hardware compatibility. It's based on the file system. In fact, it's looking like in some files. And if there is a, a mismatch between the update and the information from the firmware, it refuses to update it and it avoids probably some issues because you have probably on the compatibility. So some other features. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, it provides some hooks and uh, handlers. So you are able to write some piece of code in C or Lua to implement uh, some custom things without hacking the core of the software. So for example, if you have a FPGA with a, which needs a specific protocol to update it, uh, you can write a piece of code with that and without changing the core of the software itself. If you are using a graphical interface, for example, it could be nice to get the progression of the update 
and to display it to the user so that it's possible you can provide a callback to software update and receiving, in fact, uh, this information. You can, in the update process, there are some scripts uh, steps. Uh, so you can add in Lua or in Shell before and after the installation the scripts that you want to do. So uh, convert some data in another format uh, or maybe checking that uh, some f that the image is working well uh, as expected uh, before validating it. Uh, you can hide uh, several things uh, inside and that is very flexible. Uh, it provides also upstream developed uh, graphical interface in UI for the recovery SD design, uh, RISCU, in fact, uh, interface. So you have a screenshot here just to see uh, what this looks like. Uh, so it's really basic, but it should be enough for most of uh, use cases. And of course, it integrates in Yocto and Bredout. So when you are generating your image, it's easy to say, hey, I want the uh, update image uh, for this firmware too. That's really easy and for the workflow is very nice. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned that uh, it provides an integrated web server, so that is a screenshot to show an example uh, how it's working. So, it's a default uh, page, you can provide uh, what you want, in fact. But here you have the trace of the process uh, at the bottom, the progression bar, the button to reboot the device, and a button to select a file from your file system to send to the device. So pretty simple, but it's working. In fact, I'm using every time this interface to update my development product. It's easy, quick, and very reliable, so. So what is a update image with a software update? So it's a CPIO file, so not a very difficult or uh, complex format. Um, the first file is a software description in text mode. So you have an example uh, at the left side. Uh, it's, uh, it's in libcon for JSON, as you want. Uh, so here you can see that I check the hardware compatibility to release one. So if I'm trying to install this uh, update to, to hardware version two, it will... Uh, skipped uh, this, this update because it's not compatible. And uh, we, have, uh, we can select which copy we want to use. So here is not a complete file. We have just the first part. So we have the copy one. We can decide, oh, we have an image. The image here is a complete root uh, uh, file system. We can say which device in fact, the partition to install uh, the, the update, and if it's compressed or not, if we have a compressure um, a signature or encryption or not, we can hide this kind of information. So now I will describe my use case to see in production how it's working. So what is my context? So we have some industrial compressors, uh, very big and expensive machines, and my consumer is uh, developing a monitoring box, in fact, so we can have some sensor to monitor the temperature, the pressure, and some other variables. We are making some computes on it and sending all of this data to the cloud to be uh, checked by production guys, for example, if everything is working as expected or not, and if something should be done by them. So, uh, it's based on IMA6 uh, processor with a Yocto uh, build system. Um, the product should be uh, available and maintained uh, for months and uh, 10 years. That is a long time and is why we need uh, an update process that is working well. Uh, we can update only over Ethernet and some devices are using a mobile connection, some of them not. 
On the cloud part, we are using Cumulocity platform, which provides a QTT connection between the server and the device to receive or send data, of course. They provide some repository to push or uh, firmware or configuration files. And when we receive, uh, when we want to push an update to the device, the device receives a single string, which is an identifier to say, hey, you have a firmware update, and you have to download the content from this uh, link, and uh, using basic authentication to make the download. So which design we used? Uh, we chose to use a uh, dual copy design. Why? Because it's very, very reliable. We have not constraints about the bandwidth or the storage. And we, have don't, uh, we don't have a long downtime, and that is very important because if the downtime is too long, the, um, we don't monitor at this moment uh, the compressor, and if an issue happens with the compressor, we cannot detect it and doing something relevant to fix it. So we have to reduce in maximum this downtime. That's why we choose uh, this design. So what the device is doing when it receives the uh, order to update. So we send an acknowledgement to Cumulocity after each step that is very important. Why? Because if something wrong happened, we can know which step failed and eventually try to understand why and how to fix it, and we can understand the complete situation. That is important. So then we execute, of course, a software update. Here from C code uh, with some arguments. So the first one is to select which copy we want to use. So here we are using the partition two. Uh, so we want to install to the first copy. Then I provide the argument to select, uh, to say which URL to make the download, and some extra arguments to provide uh, basic authentication information, but I don't provide them here. So what's happened after? We download the content to TMP directory to avoid EMMC writes to have the best longevity of this component. That is important. And normally, we have enough space on memory to do that. So uh, that is not an issue. Um, but in other case, it could be nice to write in the EMMC before. Um, then we check the image av av validity. So based on the checksum of CPI file first, the hardware compatibilities, then the signature of the file. If everything is uh, OK, we can install it to the standby partition. And then, changing the new boot environment to say, hey, the update uh, finished, you can try to start on the next uh, partition. So we can reboot at this moment. Before, we saved a lot of data, of course, on the EMMC. And when the reboot finished, we have to validate the software. It took around one hour in our case, what we did uh, during this hour. In fact, we are waiting a ping from the server. So if we receive this ping, we are sure that the communication with the server is working nice. So we can make, for example, another update in case of issue. And we are sure that the software is able to run at least one hour. So that is enough time to eventually make a fix uh, remotely. So after this time, we can change the U-boot variable again to say, OK, U-boot, you can use this partition every time, no, until the next update. So here, just a presentation of Cumulocity interface. Here it's the firmware repository, so I put some images we can use uh, on devices after. Here it's a device interface. So we have on the left side the list of versions for all relevant components in the system. For example, the Linux version, the version of the software, etc. And on the right side, we can select which update uh, we can push to the device. And then we can monitor for the device what is happening. So here we have two 
uh, update, one which fails, and if we click on it, we can eventually know why. Uh, and another one uh, which is in executing. And we can have more details if we want. So here it's a complete uh, software description file, which is uh, the content that we use uh, currently. So as we can see, we have two parts, one for the first copy and one for the second copy. So it's very similar. In fact, just the partition number change. So we can, uh, we define in fact uh, the root effects files, if it's compressed or not, the device to apply it. And the U-boot part just to say, change this variable to this value. That's it. And the last part uh, of the implementation, to change uh, the U-boot variable, we can do that from user space. So when my application validates that the update is uh, working uh, fine, we can change the variable updated to zero to see to U-boot. OK, you can use this one every time if you want. Um, to generate an image, it's very simple with Yocto, just bitback and the name of the recipe to generate the image. Not difficult. Or you can do this manually with sepio command. So just the list of the files that you want inside the file, send to CPIO, and that's it. Uh, keep in mind that software description file should be the first one to work correctly. And if you are using signature, the signature should be just after this file too. And so what, uh, what is a Yocto recipe? It's very simple if you are using meta software update layer, which maintained by upstream of software update. So you have just the list of files that we want inside the update. And we can say in the variable which are going to use for the signature and another variable, variable to say uh, which path to access to the private key to make the signature. That's it. Very straightforward. So the conclusion. We have to update, of course, our uh, embedded device uh, every time when the product is arrived. That is very important. Uh, I guess it's not uh, done, uh, uh, it's not really um, done by every project, for every project, or uh, by every, uh, all companies. Uh, we have several designs to make updates. There are some others that I don't describe here. So you can choose one which match with your constraints. And we have software update, which is a nice um, a tool in open source uh, to do this task in your embedded system. Uh, you can contribute to it if you want uh, features that is not provided by the solution. And in fact, using this, uh, this tool is not a lot of work. Uh, just uh, for my use case, it took a couple of days for me to implement that, and that is working well. So really, do not hesitate to use it in production. So thank you for your attention, and if you have questions. Yes? So can you explain how this atomic uh, switchover is the dual copy approach work? Yeah. No, just, uh, just yeah. Repeat the question. Uh, but I don't <laughs> understand. Does, does this work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so can you explain how the atomic switchover between those two copies in the dual copy work and how is it atomic? Why well, it's atomic? In fact, at each step, if we have an issue, it doesn't matter for the system. It is working fine as usual, in fact. If you have an issue to download it, of course, you have nothing, so you can continue as well. If you have an issue to install it, that doesn't matter because it's another partition. So you can still use the current one. And if you have an issue, for example, to validate it, you can roll back uh, without ah. change. No, my question is, you're digging in the U-boot environment, right? Yeah. 
so what can happen at that point is you erase the storage. At that point, your UBoot environment is invalidated and you will probably fall back to the built-in UBoot environment in UBoot, which can be in random state. Okay? But, uh... And then you update the UBoot environment so it's not atomic process. And that one is in what state exactly? So you have to use the, the two copies of the environment, otherwise this is yes. unusable. Yes. yes, but in fact it's more... In fact, you don't have a lot of choice in that case. Uh, in that, yeah, you have to to implement the redundant uh, environment for that. Otherwise, yes, as you said, we can have an issue and it's not usable at all. So, just uh, relevant to that, um, in the Tianocore project when it comes to variable writing, they've actually got a, uh, the mechanism, the, the default driver that's in there will do robust writing of variables. And that's mm -hmm. probably something that we should, that U-Boot as a project should gain is uh, robust writing of variables so that you can do an update, mm -hmm. validate it, commit it before the old one gets blown away. Um, I have just a remark regarding uh, the, your proposed uh, design. Mm -hmm. The recovery OS, for yeah. example, you say that you can't update the recovery OS, but it's mm -hmm. not really true. You can update it through your main uh, your main OS. Since you know your main OS is working, you can use that to update the recovery OS. Yes, you can do that. That's true, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated. But it's more it's more difficult, and I yeah. It's and you have to I've be. Worked, I've worked on projects. And that you have to be sure that your firmware is about to running of fine. Course, of course, of course. But it's the same issue here when you yeah. write updated. You know you are in a correct state. Yeah, and the situation with the recovery OS is that you cannot update it because your main OS may get corrupted during the recovery. It can be sitting on some sort of NAND or whatever. And if the OS just breaks, then you are without the recovery and you're just. It's game over. Okay, but you, you're saying the main OS m might be corrupted when you're updating the recovery OS. That's correct. So it can be corrupted at any time, so you never know. Okay. Well, then it, yeah, you're, you're correct. It depends on the design. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's very, very similar in spirit to something we have been doing for uh, almost a decade now on our load balancers. It's very interesting. Uh, we are using an outdated version of Grub to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, we modified it and there is a small difference which I think is interesting in our case. Uh, the bootloader uh, increases the counter itself uh, before mm -hmm. booting the image. So that uh, if the image is not properly validated uh, on, uh, at the end of the boot, uh, it, the bootloader can automatically switch to the other image. And in your case, I think that it's not possible to automatically switch if an image has been properly validated. In fact, the difference is subtle, but it saved our ass uh, twice, approximately twice in a decade, uh, due to a dying flash. So the image uh, used to work fine for several days, and uh, after some time, it started to fail on the image which was uploaded, and uh, the bootloader was able to automatically reboot on the other image uh, just by the customer having to power cycle the box uh, twice. Mm -hmm. So you see the difference? In our case, it was reasonably easy from the bootloader to increment a counter, in fact. So we just use this counter to uh, to decide on which uh, image uh, we want to boot, but it's very similar to what we are, you, you are doing, in fact. And um, in this case, we don't change the counter while uh, uploading the new image, except just to switch to the new image. 
you see. Mm. So mm. Uh, each time an image does not boot, the counter continues to increase. Uh, and uh, if it fails uh, up to four times, we have two values per image. So mm. if it fails four times, it uh, switches to the recovery OS. So in this case, the customer also has an option to try to recover. But it's very similar, and I, I see a lot of, uh, of good things here. OK, thank you for your feedback. Uh, so you're keeping the company in the flat? Yes, but uh, it's on a PC. It's a compact flash. Uh, it's just, in fact, in, on the, the boot sector. It's just a, a single byte that we increment. So uh, we can even uh, end up uh, killing the flash by upgrading, uh, increasing it all the time. But uh, the risk is pretty low. Yes, but at, at How you get to that point? yes, at 200,000 uh, cycles, uh, I mean, uh, our products will not boot uh, that much. <laughs> Sorry, I, I did not understand. You, you mm. were asking how oh, I managed to have a dying flash? That was a, your question? Ah, yeah, oh, sorry. You push the flash to that limit. I mean, you have to really hammer it uh, extensively to do that. No, um, it ended up being a, a, a bad batch of compact flashes. So we figured that uh, the, same, the same brand uh, was dying in field. So we had to replace a number of compact flash in field. Okay, thank you. Apparently, we have to finish now. So.